This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagarde streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, Mexico. I'm very honored to announce that the IBC University of Oxford webinar series is a collaboration between the IBC and the Nuffield Department of Surgical Sciences, University of Oxford, and continues to grow from strength to strength with the aim to provide first class surgical education globally and to improve patient care through harnessing the global outreach of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and the IBC website, ibcclub.org. The theme of today's 95th IBC University of Oxford Hot Topics and Bariatric Surgery exclusive event is Managing Hemostasis in Robotic and Laparoscopic Bariatric Surgery, and will feature experts from the United States, Brazil, Singapore, and Mexico. The IBC University of Oxford webinar partnership would like to thank Zoom Video Communications, Laparoscopic Surge, Bariatric News, and Bariatric Channel for setting up and promoting this regularly scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, Stryker, our gold sponsors, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, USGI Medical, Medtronic, Blue Sail Surgical, David Medical, Lexington Medical, our silver sponsors, Apollo Endosurgery, GT Metabolic Solutions, our bronze sponsors, Intuitive, Arthrex, Conment. This event will be chaired by Professor Luciana El Cadre from Brazil and will be moderated by Dr. Asim Shabir from Singapore and Professor Andre Teixeira from the United States. Our chair today is Professor Luciana El Cadre. Professor El Cadre is head of Center of Obesity, Diabetes, and Metabolic Health in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, scientific director of Brazilian College of Digestive Surgery, Scientific Committee, IFSO 2021 2025, and former fellow in liver transplantation, University of Spit Pittsburgh. Medical Center, USA. I will now pass it on to Professor El Cadre to introduce our esteemed moderators. Hello, everybody. So good to be here again. Hello, Ario. I'd like to introduce my moderators. Uh, the first moderator is Professor Andrea Teixeira. He's a vice chair of general surgery and director of bariatric endoscopy and Bariatric Surgery Fellowship at Orlando Health in Florida, USA. And Dr. Azim Shabir from Singapore, his deputy head of Department of Surgery, National University Hospital, National University of Singapore. He's also director of Center for Obesity Management and Surgery and assistant professor of surgery, National University of Singapore. I would like to ask my friend Andre to introduce our first speaker, please. It is my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Farah Hussein. <clears throat> She's an executive counselor at SMBS. She's a photon endowed chair in bariatric surgery, and metabolic disorders, vice chair of quality of medicine, and associate professor, at the Department of Surgery, University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. She also is surgical director, of obesity and metabolic disorders services line at Banner University, Metro Group, Arizona. She'll be talking about staple line reinforcement and its impact on staple line bleeding, genuine game changer or splitting hairs. Thank you so much to the chairs, the moderators and to IBC for this opportunity. Uh, it's such an honor to be here speaking to my peers on this topic. And I look forward to hopefully a very interesting discussion on the topic today. So I just wanted to start with a few short clips of the different types of staple line reinforcement that are out there. Many of us have seen different ways that you can utilize staple line reinforcement. And we have so many different things that we can choose from in this world. You have things that mount directly on your staplers. You have ones that are sewn to the stapler, that are glued to the stapler. And then we have simple techniques like over sewing that are also staple line reinforcements. So we batch a lot of things together here, but there are so many different options to utilize. And that might be one of the most confusing things in the world of staple line reinforcement is when we talk about SLR, what are we talking about? Are we talking about specifically materials that we are putting on the stapler that you have here are an example of many different types, which even within those groups are not necessarily the same. We range from having bovine pericardium, suture material, bioabsorbable polymers, extracellular matrixes, so many different types that are out there. Then onwards to things that people will consider like glues, over sewing of the staple line. Um, and are all these things the same and the results that they lead us to? 
really when we first talk about staple line reinforcement in the world of bariatric surgery, I think most of us were concerned about leaks. We weren't necessarily worried as much about the bleeding, but we knew about the morbidity and the mortality from leaks. So Michel Gagné's group, when they looked at this in 2014, focused primarily on what are the outcomes related to leaks. And at that time, there were primarily two types of, of reinforcements on the market. There was a bovine pericardial strip and there was an absorbable polymer membrane. When they looked at those, they did see that there was a decreased uh, trend in leaks with the absorbable polymer. But these are probably different even from what we use today. In this study, he wasn't even really looking at leaks because again, or bleeds because of the concern for the leaks. However, as we move forward a few years in 2016 at the American Surgical Society meeting, Dr. Hutter's group presented this paper that was really a landmark paper initially looking at leaks and bleeds related to staple line reinforcement. This was one of the first MBSA QIP reviews of a large database, looking at all the sleeve gastrectomies done from 2011 until 2015 and comparing variables like staple line reinforcement, distance from the pylorus and bougie size to look at sleeve outcomes. Uh, all the who's who in the world of bariatrics were really authors on this paper and the who's who in quality like Dr. Ronnie Clemens. And what did they find? Well, interestingly, indeed, we did see a decrease in bleeding rate with both staple line reinforcement as well as staple line reinforcement combined with oversewing. What was concerning when this study came out, however, was there was also a significant increase in leak rate when these staple line reinforcements and combination therapies were applied to the staple line. And that was very alarming to many people because then we started to say, whoa, are we doing too much to our staple line? Should we actually not be doing these things? Because when people had leaks, they had more mortality and morbidities related to those leaks. And this was very significant. So I think this study really surprised many people when we saw these outcomes. Naturally, folks follow that up. And we looked at Dr. Carmali's group out of Canada, looking at the participant use files of MBSA QIP, and they keyed in on 2015 to 16 and about 175,000 patients. In that group, there was only about a 0.6% of postoperative bleed, but the bleeding was associated with significant mortality, taking mortality up to 1% versus 0.1%. And they were also statistically significantly increased with all complications, including readmissions, reoperations, and 30-day mortality. So although the bleeding rate was small, it caused downstream consequences. And in their um, meta-analysis here, their logistic regression analysis, they did find that staple line reinforcement was an independent predictor to lower the risk of postoperative bleeding. And this increased whether in, this included whether it was material staple line reinforcement over sewing of the of suture line as well. Interestingly, in their group, also a higher body mass index was found to be protective from bleeding after you adjusted for the confounders and interactions. Now, nearly the same population, again, looking at the 2015-16 PUF, Dr. Edwards' group out of Mayo Clinic looked at this in a little different fashion. They used staple line utilization uh, to create two cohorts, and they were unmatched cohort analysis that was going to be performed. Uh, they used a propensity score and a case-controlled matched cohort analysis. And when they looked at this, they did find that bleeding and reoperation were significantly higher in the cohort without staple line reinforcement but there was no difference in mortality or staple line leak between the two groups. So uh, two different types of analysis done on nearly the same population. Both did show that there was some incre increased improvement in bleeding if you use some type of staple line reinforcement. But as we all know, we want the RCTs and RCTs and RCTs, right? That's our, our gold standard. So in the meta-analysis of the RCTs done in 2016, they looked at eight randomized controlled trials with about 791 patients. And when they looked at these groups, they found that staple line reinforcement lowers the risk of hemorrhage, overall complications as well. But when over sewing was the staple line reinforcement used, it did increase the operative time. Now, of these eight RCTs, only three of them compared over sewing versus buttress. And when they looked at the over sewing versus buttress, only one study compared over sewing versus a material staple line reinforcement. So really this was one RCT looking at over sewing versus staple line reinforcement of the material. The other two compared over sewing versus a glue reinforcement of the staple line. And so again, I think the, one of the challenges we have is we're not always comparing maybe apples to apples in the world of staple line reinforcement when we see these benefits and maybe even not sussing out the difference between the specific types of reinforcement that are being used. 
Dr. Gagne's group again, they repeated this type of a uh, randomized controlled trial meta-analysis. And this was just recently published with a beautiful visual abstract that I'm sharing here. Um, they looked at multiple different types of reinforcement. They looked at suture reinforcement, glue reinforcement, bioabsorbable, and clip reinforcement versus non, no reinforcement. And what they found was that suture reinforcement did in fact decrease um, bleeding versus no reinforcement. And it was equivalent to all of the other types of reinforcement, whether it was glue, uh, staple line material or buttressing or clip reinforcement. And again, not surprisingly, we see the operative time was the longest with the suture reinforcement. So this reinforces that doing something to the staple line may improve bleeding, but depending on what you choose, you may change your operative times. Now, the good thing with leakage, that all of the reinforcements were very equivalent in leakage decrease, but that suture reinforcement, again, did decrease staple line leaks as well. So is there any other evidence out there that has been proven to decrease bleeding in our world? And I do focus on sleeves here, I have to say primarily, because there's a paucity of data in the world of the use of bypass and staple line reinforcement. It really is focused primarily on sleeve because I think we've all found that's been our nuisance area in staple line bleeding. Well, oversewing seems to be one of the options that is out there that maybe will be a little less expensive. And there were two RCTs that looked specifically at oversewing versus no reinforcement. In this study, there were 200 patients that had oversewing versus 200 without oversewing. Again, no surprises, surgical time was longer in the group where they were oversewed. However, interestingly, in the group that was oversewed, they had a higher percent excess body weight loss as well. So they presented that there might be another benefit to oversewing your staple line and that the patients may have a higher percent excess weight loss overall. There was one leak in the non-reinforced group and the bleeding rate was significantly lower in the oversewing group in this RCT. And then in a smaller group, they again looked at 30 patients suture reinforcement versus no reinforcement. They were oversewing the entirety of the staple line and had similar findings of longer time to oversew. But they really uh, stressed holding compression of the stapler for the full recommended time on every firing of the staple of the staplers. They had two leaks in their non-reinforcement group, but they have no bleeding in any of their patients. And what they really wanted to stress in this study, and I thought was an intriguing thing that sometimes we perhaps don't talk about, is proper technique with our staplers. Are we closing them and holding them for the adequate compression time? And if we do that each time, does that in any way help minimize the risk of bleeding? And maybe we're overlooking such a simple intervention as patients at the end of the day. I always say that 15 seconds of compression uh, kills me slowly on the inside if I actually count to 15. So who knows what we do in that? Well, in the world of trauma, TXA really had a big launch in decreasing bleeding. And I think in the world of bariatrics, it's something that people are starting to touch on a little more is how do we use transexamic acid? And is that something that could be utilized? It's not that cost prohibitive at all, actually. And oftentimes this dose is only a one-time dosing. So Dr. Carmali, again, out of the Canada's group, looked at four studies that looked at 475 patients. This was split into about 207 patients or 50% of the population that received TXA at induction during their sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, with the TXA administration, one thing that they wanted to confirm that there was no difference in VTE incidence or mortality with the use of TXA, and that was very important. They also did a meta-analysis of postoperative bleeding, and they saw a statistically significant benefit with TXA administration at induction of sleeve gastrectomy. So a new intervention that maybe some had not thought about that could be a one-time dosing. And this was repeated in another prospectively double-blinded study. In this study, they looked at 61 patients, 30 in a control group and 30 in the TXA group, uh, and they administered it again at the beginning of surgery. In the intraoperative period, uh, the bleeding volume that they saw during surgery seemed to be less with the TXA group versus the control group. And in the postoperative period, the TXA group had short, less incidence of bleeding and a higher hem hematocrit uh, discharge. And there were no surgical reoperations due to bleeding uh, or and uh, in the TXA group. So again, uh, mentioning that this might be an intervention that could be considered. And finally, out of this Italian group and Dr. Tartaglia, this was a study where they looked at their patients in a three-year range from 2017 to 2020 in group A. And then from 2020 to 2022, they qualified as group B. 
and they implemented some some relatively simple changes during this time frame. In the latter two years, they started at the end of their case to increase their mean arterial pressure in their patients by 30%, and they dropped their pneumoperitoneal pressure from 15 down to eight at the conclusion of their case. And it was for the primarily the last 15 minutes of their case. And they saw a significant decrease in bleeding by doing this. But those interventions allowed them to intervene in ideally in, intraoperatively on potential bleeding sites on the staple line, as well as on the um, omental side of the division and prevent hopefully future bleeds. So their pre-intervention group, they had nine bleeds, including one that was hemodynamically unstable and required repeat laparoscopy. In their post-intervention group, they had two bleeds uh, in group B and only one blood transfusion that was needed. So they did, their stress was, again, maybe we need to think about technique and some of the things that we may be doing that artificially mask bleeding and don't allow us to capture it at the time of surgery. What about different types of staplers? Well, we don't know about this. And I just throw this out to let people know it's being evaluated out there. And my disclaimer, I don't use either of these staplers, so I have no bias towards either of them. This group used a visual analog scale, and they had an independent bariatric surgeon review this, the uh, images on the day of surgery as well to take away any inter, uh, test rel um, reliability issues. They analyzed five locations on the stomach with their visual analog scale and scored them on how they looked as far as bleeding, both laparoscopically and endoscopically. And they did find that one stapler seemed to appear more hemostatic than the other. This is something I don't think we know much about. We don't know if there is a better utilization of the stapler. We don't know if, uh, again, using the staplers in a proper recommended technique might decrease bleeds overall as it hasn't been studied well, but there are a lot of devices and techniques out there that might also help us in this quest. So in conclusion, I think I probably left that as confusing as possible, but staple line reinforcement, when we look at the studies overall, it does seem to demonstrate that it decreases bleeding in large database studies, as well as the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. However, other in interventions may be available and we might have things that we can do that are more related to technique. We do have to think about our operative time versus our intervention and what's important to us at the end of the day because they can impact some of those things. But probably the most important theme is to evaluate our own individual data in our workplaces and see, are we outliers in bleeding? And if so, what kinds of things are we doing? And can we incorporate perhaps some of these other techniques to decrease our bleeding overall? And with that, again, I thank the IBC, uh, the moderators, our chair, as well as Dr. Ortiz for the privilege of speaking today. Thank you all. Can you get back to me, Gloria? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Okay, Harris, don't don't kill me because I'm going to ask more than one question. Uh, congrats, <laughs> Dr. Farah. It's Thank very you. accurate presentation, and I can give you my time in other presentations to my moderators. Is that okay? So, <laughs> so is that okay? Okay. Go for okay. it. Go for it. So uh, we we know that the most significant uh, uh, complication in the sleeve gastrectomy is bleeding. And the reported rates are as high as 16%. And as Dr. Farah said, uh, currently no high quality evidence supports the use of one method over the other. So also uh, we don't have a, a, a clear concept of what is postoperative bleeding is something that requires another operation. Because if it is so, uh, uh, also increasing time is okay if you can avoid another operation. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, do you recommend a specific type of staple line reinforcement? I can't say I can recommend anything specific. I think at the end of the day, this data clearly shows it depends on what you use, using it well and properly more than anything else. Uh, I was actually really intrigued because I thought in the studies and particularly in the meta-analysis of the RCTs, there would be more of the synthetic material usage. And whereas it was much more predominantly over sewing of the staple line. So it just shows that sometimes getting back to basics might actually be one of the best things, but we have to get over our own need to go faster. <laughs> and I think that's a nature of an efficient surgeon that we want to move faster, but there is a difference between fast and efficient. And I think we have to determine that fine line of saying, 
slow down at the right parts of surgery, right? And take care of the business that you need to. And what is your opinion about TXA? Because TXA is an independent factor for thromboembolic events. So what your opinion about it? Yeah, I was very intrigued by the study that Dr. Carmali's group did because I was happy to see that it was not a predicting increased VTE in our patient population. And that's something else that we worry about, obviously, at a high rate is that we cannot have an increase in VTE. And we've managed to keep that at such a low rate overall with all of our measures in bariatric surgery. But I am intrigued about TXA more, I think, on the side of intervention, even postoperatively in patients that are having bleeding complications. Might it help decrease their return to the operating room or decrease the amount of transfusion that you need to give them? I don't know if I'm ready to start administering it uh, at induction in every patient, but I did look up the costs on it too, just to understand the cost analysis. And it is uh, now affordable across the board. It can range as low as $40 for a dose of TXA. So in the US at least, that is not an intervention that I would cross out by any stretch based on these studies. It looks like the risk of VTE is quite low um, based on what we have. But again, our data is small. There are only four trials really out there on TXA in bariatric surgery. So we need to follow that. And if people start to use it, I would say that's a variable we should capture in our databases so that we can understand what's happening with TXA. Okay, thank you. Andre? For our amazing presentation, as always, you're always a uh, great speaker. So, a couple of things. One is I, I, I've played around with TXA a little bit, but what worries me is the part of endothrombosis, right? It only takes one and the entire cost saving, everything is down the drain, right? Uh, I'd rather get a bleeding than a, um, uh, a PVT, like anybody here. Two, every time you have a bleeding from the, the sleeve, for every reason, we always say it's a staple line. But sometimes it's short gastrics. Right, so is it, is it the short gastrics really are gonna be affected by our SLRs? Really not, right? So I agree with you, you have to take, take your time during this sleep. It's not the stapling portion, it's also make sure you colorize the vessels and so forth. Number three is, I agree with you, uh, there's only one study that I know, which is the one you talked about, that comparing staples to another staple, right? Because I think there is a variability right? We always talk about reinforcements, but we never tell robotic versus lab, ethical, intuitive, whatever, any other ones, right? So, so that, 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 that's just a comment. The question I have is, what is your thought about what's happening here in the United States, especially with the robotic surgeons, this push to downsize to white loads to decrease bleeding? So it feels like we are changing the surgical techniques that we've been training done forever to fit a technology versus the other way around. So I, I don't know if you have a thought on that or not. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the downsizing of staple. And as I looked at this data, it's something that I, I pondered even more because I thought functionally when we started putting in, especially material reinforcement, in some ways were we somewhat mocking or, or mimicking rather uh, downsizing our stapler because we were adding thickness to the tissue. And so in fact, maybe we were functionally making that stapler a smaller size because of that thickness. And I don't know if that's really what I'm saying is translating very well, but what are we doing when we're putting in that reinforcement and, and what does that reflect in staple line downsizing? I think one thing though, that is that for a long time, we have been taught about certain staple reloads and what material, what organ it should go on. And I say, I go back, unfortunately now, to my training almost 20 years ago, and I'm still going to lie about my age, but we always learned green gastric, blue bowel, and we found out very shortly thereafter that wasn't accurate, right? You don't have to use green on gastric all the time. You don't have to use blue on small bowel, and many of us step down. I use white loads, for example, now primarily on bowel. Um, I'm not opposed to downsizing your staple stapler, and I think the technology is actually quite smart, and I'm glad engineers are very smart people when they look at these tissue compression studies and try to evaluate what allows full closure of the staple and allows good formation. I don't think though that there's a one size fits all. I don't think you can just say, okay, I'm going to downsize all of my staple loads on this tissue now because I had one bleed. I'm not sure that that's the right answer. I think you still have to use your clinical acumen looking at your tissue thickness and looking at 
Is it bleeding? As I fire it, is it pausing a lot? What's going on with that? And use that as feedback. So again, it's thinking about each of your steps and realizing, can you step down? Probably on some tissue you can, and you should know that gastric tissue that you see that's very thin, that you're comfortable stepping down on your staple load. Conversely, you also should know if you have thicker tissue, probably don't do that. Even if someone's in the room telling you it's safe, don't worry, because that's not their clinical footprint, right? That's not their expertise. And it's on us at the end of the day. If you're really worried about it, I mean, I think if anything, what these studies show is that you can always over sew a staple line and you can do it and get pretty darn good results. So if you use a larger size stapler and you're having a lot of oozing or you're not very happy with those results, don't don't be fearful of going back to the suturing. That's what we know how to do and that's why we are where we are. So uh, I think it's not unsafe to downsize. I think it's more of using, again, your clinical acumen to make sure you're using the right size for the tissue that you're working on. Dr. Shabir, please. Hi. Uh Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, for, uh, so um, the part of the world I come from, maybe we're not so, um, what should I say? Uh, most of us do not use staple line material uh, reinforcements because of cost issues. Um, and we do suture. Um, what would your advice be in terms of suturing? What would you advise? What kind of sutures and what technique would you advise to use if people are to use suturing as one of the uh, tools? Thank you. Absolutely. So this was definitely based on our data challenging because when we are qualifying suturing, especially in our large database studies, it's just yes or no. And it's not necessarily saying, are they oversewing the entire staple line? just the intersection of the staples or just a specific segment. Um, so I would be presenting this purely on my own bias. Uh, I would be inclined to over sew the entire staple line type of suture, I don't think matters. I think if you're looking at cost savings, you use uh, a non-barbed suture because that is going to be less expensive. If you're looking again at, you want to have maybe a little more efficiency and time savings, perhaps a barbed suture might be something that you can use so that you don't have to tie knots, that'll save a little bit of time. Um, but when they, the study where they had increased uh, excess weight loss, they, in that they did specify they were over sewing the entire staple line. And so I think if you're worried all about leaving a little extra fundus, leaving a little space up by the GE junction so that you don't get those increased leak issues, um, being kind to the incisure, I always say, so that you don't get an outlet obstruction by being too tight there that you can compensate for some of that redundancy in the tissue by potentially over sewing your entire staple line and still get very good results. So I think the last ladder studies showed to me more than anything that technique is really important in doing good compression, potentially raising some blood pressure, lowering your pneumoperitoneum. These things are very straightforward to do at no cost, uh, really. So maybe we should be focusing on some of these no cost technique based things as well and see if we can harness that before we start spending a lot of money on extra gadgets. Does everybody agree that uh, suturing will prevent bleeding, but an invaginating suture will prevent bleeding and a leak? It's hard to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> The tough conclusion to draw. I uh, think invaginate is going to increase more pressure, right? So then you can have more leaks. You think right? this? So you can. I've you seen do. it. So okay. I don't have data to prove it. Okay, Pierre, do you want to to, to show us your opinion about it? Well, the biggest cause for the leak, right, is at an angle of hiss. And so if you are invaginating the tissue, you're therefore causing more outward obstruction and increased pressure, depending on how they, they suture it. So, okay, Brian? The staple line would be fine. We have two minutes, Brian. Oh, for me, um, I, I typically, te I tend not to oversew. Um, I, when I started, I used to oversew the whole staple line. I didn't necessarily notice a difference in terms of bleed rate. Um, you know, obviously bleeds are, are super frustrating. I, I I agree that if you staple too aggressively, you could certainly cause increased pressure, increased back pressure on the fundus. So, um, but 
I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm on the fence. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shabir, please, to introduce our second speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's my honor uh, and privilege to introduce Dr. Perlma. Dr. Perlma is an associate clinical professor of surgery at University of California, San Francisco. She's also the director of research at Advanced Laparoscopic Surgical Associate, uh, Fresno, California. Uh, her memberships uh, are with the ASMBS uh, in the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and she's also a member of the SAGES Bariatric and Metabolic Committee. Uh, Dr. Palma will speak to us today about how the staple uh, reload optimize impact staple line bleeding. Uh, Dr. Palma, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's my pleasure to present today. I think Andre asked a very good question to segue into my talk. So thank you very much. And Dr. Hussain did an excellent uh, presentation to segue. Now I'll repeat some of these things as well for her. Can you see everything okay? Great, excellent. Okay, so the question is, of course, is can we not use all these extra things? And why can't our stapler just be great enough to not bleed, not leak? Um, why do we have to reinforce things? Why do we have to put glue, TXA? And why can't just our stapler that we use currently just be better? And can we downsize that staple reload to simply just decrease bleeding that we don't have to do anything else? So uh, we'll examine that a little bit in today's talk here. So some disclosures, I do some speaking for Medtronic Ethicon, but that won't weigh too much on this talk today. Um, although I do use primarily uh, Ethicon staplers and the tri-stapler as well. So this is a case where a uh, gastric bypass patient uh, presented back on post-op day one, increasing abdominal pain, hemoglobin dropped. You can see here, this is actually the JJ, which has got obstruction here. And there's actually hemoperitoneum as well. And so looking intraluminally, you can see in the rulum, there's just a lot of blood. And this blood is actually going all the way down to the JJ. The JJ is actually um, has a little bit of leakage, a micro leak that's developed because of so much blood that causes increased pressure that overwhelmed that suture line. So essentially, she's got obstruction from a blood bezoar that came from the gastric remnant. And so here we opened up the JJ, suctioned out the clot. There's tons of clot. You can see we've already suctioned the aspirate and a lot of blood intraluminally to get some working space. And this is frustrating, right? Um, this is essentially, we saw that the staple line was uh, most likely the source, so we oversewed that at the take back. So this is frustrating to see, right? Um, and then of course, bleeding from um, potentially staple lines from sleeves. And this is a, of course, in preparation for this talk, I had a bleed. And, and so um, this is a patient that was taken back on post-op day zero and the patient just didn't look right, didn't feel right, didn't get a CT scan. We got a hemoglobin that dropped, but it was enough to just take the patient back. And we're pretty aggressive at my facility to take patients back, to do a washout, take a look, not just transfuse them and just, um, just kind of see how they do, but rather just get it done during the day and not in the middle of the night here at this uh, private practice. So um, you can see the staple line is a little bit oozy there. There's no big bleeder of the short gastric. Um, and so this was a little bit frustrating uh, as well. So bleeding after surgery, it's not the leaks that are the more troublesome, especially in immediate post-op. It can be very life-threatening. Um, as we said uh, from uh, Dr. Hussain's talk, there's a practically tenfold risk of mortality with patients with bleeding. And the most common site is a staple line that we see. The short gastrics, the arterial bleeding, those are gonna be quick bleeders that you can see in the post in the recovery area that you can take the patients back. but. Uh, the staple line is a slow ooze that happens. And so the, the range, as Dr. Um, Luciana mentioned, it can be anywhere for up to 10%, depending on the papers you see. But generally it's around two to 4% or so. The cost of bleeding after a sleeve gastrectomy in this uh, Swedish study as well, I'm sorry, in the Netherlands, there is a high cost that is associated with bleeds, as we know, in all of our patients that we have that have a complication, they do stay longer. Um, and this is approximately 4,200 dollars of years that is left um, as an additional cost for bleeding. And that range can go all the way up to 40,000 or so, or more, depending on the ICU stay and of course the morbidity 
uh, in complications of the patients afterwards. And so these patients that they saw in their database, um, they were able to see that this is associated with the ICU stay as well as staying post-operative, as well as the interventions that may be required, the CT drainages, uh, just the plasma, antibiotics, and all those things that are associated with this. So staple line bleeds, what is the cause? So it can be multiple things, not just a staple line, it can be because of the patient factors. Um, as Dr. Hussain mentioned before, you know, perhaps um, in his paper, and I'll mention that again a little bit later, there are certain patient factors, hypertension and such, and as of the technical aspect or, or such. Can we downgrade our staple heights? And this is going against dogma, right? We are trained, um, as Dr. Hussain mentioned, that you know, where blue is bowel, green is gastric and such. Um, but where did that come from? Where did we learn that? And can we change that? And it took me a long time to downgrade my steeple heights. Uh, yeah, I had to watch other people kind of go through it and, and really saw the results from that and realized, you know, I'm kind of tired of doing things like oversewing, um, doing um, extra interventions, SLRs. And really, it's like, can I just use a good staple line and just downgrade this? And, and our leak rates have not increased. Our bleeding rate has actually decreased. And, and so I've been happy about this so far. So. What do I mean by that? So our staples that we have right now, how do we determine what, what's a good staple line? Staple height, as we know, is a critical factor in determining how well that staple line is going to be formed. We want good compression, we want good hemostasis and good tissue penetration so we don't have leaks. So we want the ideal stapler. And so we have a variety of different types, but we really want that B-shaped formation of that staple line. And you can see there's a big variation, right? And these are all acceptable types of B-shaped formations. And you can see some are a little bit wonky, um, some are great compression and how it fits with the, the B cell. Um, and some are, my. this is like my toddler drawing a B, right? This is uh, not, doesn't really look like a, a good B in that sense. So, but these are acceptable staple lines that we see. It's interesting when you talk about industry, um, they mentioned that, you know, if you prefer a drier staple line, yes, you downsize. But if you prefer more perfusion to your staple line, you have a higher staple height. But at the same time, why, you know, any surgeon that's going to look at this is going to say, well, I do want more perfusion. I don't want to leak. That's going to be more troublesome to the patient than a drier staple line. So this is kind of interesting from, from industry standpoint and what they also consider. Do you want a drier or more perfusion? Obviously, you're going to opt for more perfusion in this sense. So industry has now, um, has not caught up to downsizing as well, but I think that's, that's probably a little bit of a liability issue. We know that the tissue thickness as we go along the staple line varies in terms of location as well. We know it's thickest at the antrum. We can see the muscle fibers change as the function of the stomach also progresses as well. We know it's thinner at the, the fundus. And this has been measured um, pathologically as well. These specimens that are taken immediately to the pathologist, they're measuring the tissue thickness. And we can see the muscle fibers are continuing to decrease as we progress along the stomach. So this also varies among sex. Uh, males have a thicker uh, tissue thickness as well. Uh, we also know that with age and being thinner as well, um, diabetes may be thicker uh, as well as smoking. So these are all patient factors to consider when considering your staple line. So as the theme of AI and such, can I ask AI this question and can it do the talk for me? And unfortunately it can't. So I asked exactly this question, how can staple load, reload uh, decreasing the size help with hemostasis? And I actually just recommended to ask an experienced bariatric surgeon. So this didn't really help, but it did help my planning for the IBC trip in the Oxford in September. Um, so if you are going to Oxford, it's very helpful for that. <laughs> So otherwise, so staple height. We know that taller staples um, can lead to decreased integrity of the staple line, potentially predisposing to leaks. However, if you overcompress it, we thought in the past that if you do too much compression, you can see that um, it can cause ischemia and this can lead to complications. But we know this isn't true. We have some papers now to look at this and say that it's not necessarily a increased risk for leak, but actually could be protective. And this is a study um, in Sweden, looking at the uh, SOS database as well from 2010 to 2017. And they did a stapled, linear stapled gastrojejunostomy in bariatric surgery. And they found that the closed staple height greater than 1.5 millimeters, and that's essentially a blue or a white load, um, or sorry, bigger than a blue or a white load um, for an echelon stapler, 
that actually led to higher risk of post-operative complications with bleeding, leaks, and things like that within 30 days of the surgery compared to a lower staple height. So they actually recommended to do a blue or a white load on your you know, staple load here. So in this study here, um, they also looked at um, just measuring the tissue thickness with a standard bariatric measuring device. And they had two different protocols in these sleeve patients. So two surgeons at a single institution. Um, there was a little bit of bias here because the authors were employed by standard bariatrics or so, but they had two stapling protocols that were used. One was the more traditional case, uh, about 64 cases using the green, blue, blue, blue for Epicon staple line. The second protocol was used as a blue, blue, white, white, or a gold, blue, white, white. So using white along uh, the staple line. And they measured um, the tissue uh, as well as the compression and also examined the bleeding rate and they measured every centimeter along the staple line. And so for every increase in, um, it, as, as we downside their staple line here, we saw that there was actually a reduction in bleeding rate quite significantly. So 59% um, with depending on uh, which staple line, but compared to the first protocol, there definitely had a lower intraoperative bleeding rate less usage of hemostatic techniques, vibrant glue, over sewing, hemostatic treatments, and all those things. And so a shorter post staple height exerted more pressure, but also decreased intraoperative bleeding in sleeves. And so that was their conclusion on that. This is an Israeli study as well, 202 consecutive patients under one sleeve. They routinely left to drain in these patients. Um, and they typically use the blue on the antrum and white staple loads on the body and the fundus. And again, they saw that this was a safe outcomes and decreased bleeding rates as well. And they took out the drain, they used the drain as a measure of the bleeding as well. And um, also noticed from their change from prior operations that they were able to decrease their bleeding rate significantly as well. So this is a video here of, of, of one of my um, patients here. This is actually a blue SLR, first fire, and then I routinely use white further down. And so you can see here, the compression's better. There's less, I don't see any bleeding, which is great. I usually see some type of bleeding with my other staple fires when I used to use green, gold, and a, and a rainbow of colors going up. But however, this is the same patient that I mentioned that I showed the video earlier. So this is the bleed on post-op day zero. It wasn't a short gastric bleed. It wasn't um, something else, but you can see that staple line on the left, right? There's oozing on that staple line and that's a white load. And so, what I'm trying to say here is that it's it, you can still bleed uh, even with the white load. You can still bleed with the blue load. It's, but downsizing may decrease that, but it doesn't prevent bleeds. You can't prevent bleeds, not necessarily. So this is the paper that um, I believe Dr. Hussein also mentioned here. Um, this is a retrospective cohort of patients, a single center, 2005 to 2019. Good amount of patients among five surgeons of five different techniques. This was done at Methodist Houston. There's no difference in the technique that they use, staple fires um, and reinforcements and things like that. And, and they found that even with the energy devices, there's no difference. They could not find a rhyme or reason of why leads happen. And it wasn't necessarily a device that you use or the staple line reinforcement. In addition, with that paper that Dr. Hussein also mentioned, there are independent predictors of a bleeding after a sleeve. Perhaps this was done, uh, perhaps the hypertension, renal insufficiencies, if the patients are on anticoagulation, the operative length as well. But this is data from the MS MBSA CLIP database, so not necessarily um, uh, inclusive of everything here. So increase in the mean arterial pressure by 30% may reduce the bleeding as well, um, as well as reducing the pneumoperitoneum. And then also um, with a different abdominal wall compliance, this may actually help kind of standardize that. In patients that you're doing a very fast case, and you know, if you're doing a 30 minute, 45 minute sleeve, sometimes the anesthesiologist may not be aware that you're closing and you, you couldn't have finished operations and the, blood, the patient's blood pressure is still low. So that's always nice to kind of look over at the um, anesthesiologist and see what the blood pressure is doing and such. Or you could also use this to blame the anesthesiologist for your bleed, but no, um, but in general, <laughs> increasing the blood pressure is a very easy thing to do. So I'll conclude this by saying here, this is this was um, on from Facebook. Uh, this was some of the quotes from Ed Felix and Natan uh, 
talking about how do we prevent bleeds? Is it the staple line reinforcement? Is it the stapler? Some people mentioned, I don't ever have bleeds with this stapler and such, but you know, the more cases you do, the more complications you're going to have. So uh, Ed Felix here quoted, uh, no matter how much hype by the companies or by individual surgeons, both staplers work just fine. There are the idiosyncrasies of your stapler and they are equal. It's not the stapler, it's the stapler, meaning us, the surgeons. And the time it says it's all about the patient status, cartridge selection, and about being patient before firing. So to echo Dr. Hussein's, um, it is about being patient, laying that staple fire, that tissue creep will occur uh, while you're compressing the stapler, perhaps doing pulse firing as well, but just really learning your instrument and um, and 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 also perhaps downsizing. I, I really believe that downsizing is um, can be very helpful, uh, but I think you have to try it and see if you're seeing some cirrhosis cracking along that staple fire, even if you're using white, then perhaps that is too thick. And you can also have that, um, that feedback, audible feedback as well when you're using that staple fire. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for the honor of talking today. Thank you so much, uh, Piro. Uh, Dr. Shabir, do you wanna talk? Wanna... No, no, go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, just very quickly, Andrea, <laughs> very quickly. Uh, Piro, I'm going against ChatGPT and I want to hear your opinion. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're, you're going against ChatGPT? Yeah, because ChatGPT asked us to go, uh, go on literature and meetings to know what is better. And I want to hear your opinion after your wonderful <laughs> presentation. <laughs> um, so it's, it's um, what is it? I use my mentor's quote, common sense trumps expert opinion. And so I think use your staple line, use, your, uh, use what works for you and your experience and look at your own database to see how your outcomes are as well. And be familiar with your, your instrument more than anything. Downsizing is okay. If you like, if you feel that you have better experience using the stapler and using the SLR, then do that. Um, I used to routinely over sew with PDS, just a free needle of all my staple lines. And I've stopped doing that. Um, I just downsized my, my stapler cartridge. And it's, it's it took, Dr. Kelvin Higa to do it for about a year before I actually believed him. I didn't believe him. I said he was full of S, you know, basically S H I T, and uh, I didn't believe him. I, and then I started. I was like waiting for his leaks and bleeds, and I was like, okay, I'll wait for your bleeds and and see. And then I realized that our numbers, when I looked at our data, the bleed rate was much lower. And it's not to say that you were, you know, a bad surgeon or something was wrong, but it was just simply the staple line looked a lot better and all those little factors that came into play um, changed my opinion. So I, we started downsizing. So, okay. so Pearl, I have a question for you. So when we talk about handheld, Greg, I agree with you 100%. I agree with everyone that's also operator dependent and da 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 When you're on a robotic platform, which is only one right now, um, we don't have that control, right? The stapler is the one that decides through some algorithm magic behind the scene, the pauses for compression, pauses for compression and so forth. So we, so that is kind of up to outside of the control of the surgeon. So the, the surgeon only has one control is downsize or upsize or even put in reinforcement, right? Mm -hmm. So as you know, there's a big push from to white loads here, um, which is okay. The, the, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I gotta see the data, right? because people report and talking, but I wanna see the data. I do see that there is some stomachs that are very thin, that are white loads are easy, boom, go, flies right through it, right? Um, but that's not the majority of the cases. As you, see, as you show it, white loads still can have bleeding. There's so many different components to it. What, what your thought on ideally, what is a perfect, leave done in terms of firing the stapler, including time and so forth. Well, what would you think, pressure, etc. Ideally. So what, like what is what, the ideal what stapler? The, yeah, I mean, what would be the ideal stapler for you? How long to fire? You know, if time was important and all that. I mean, just you put all of the considerations and you say this would be the ideal one to do it. 
Well, I, definitely one that you don't have to wait and compress and do extra things to for that staple line is mm-hmm. definitely the ideal that you can just shoot and fire, shoot and fire and go. Just like you're using your um, endoscopic ultrasonic shears, right? Um, all those mm-hmm. things are, are, are important. Um, this is interesting because when we talk about the ideal sleeve and the staple line, right? There's also that one, the Titan mm-hmm. stapler is coming out too. Um, that's, that's very mm-hmm. interesting. But the ideal stapler is where you don't have to do anything to it. It just works. It just does what you're supposed to do. Maybe perhaps tissue sensoring uh, from that. There's AI algorithms that can measure and, and, and sense the tissue thickness and the blood supply with ICG that's going permeating to the staple line. And once you've injected the ICG, now it can examine the staple line and see the rate of flow into that um, tissue and perhaps adapt as it goes. And so How, like anything, AI is going to be smarter than us. And perhaps it's going to be something that that's developed in the future to do that, to make us, also, you know, we're all dumb surgeons, right? We just, we got to stay, stay in our box. Yeah. And uh, I, I think to a big thing would be a algorithm regulation of the staple height, right? As you fire, you get the automatic changes, they, they staple height for you, right? So that'd be another way to, to help, but just, just thought. Yeah, absolutely. The goal is to, to have a robot to do all of our surgeries in the future. That's all to replace exactly. us. Oh, but that's, I'll be retired by then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Shabir, please. Thanks, uh, Paul. That was, uh, there were some real pearls of wisdom there. Um, just for the benefit of the greater audience who would be listening to this uh, webinar, how do you teach to choose the correct stapler? Uh, height. Um, what would be your advice to the general audience who would be listening to you may not have had the luxury of a mentor who could really tell them how to choose staple heights uh, of different heights? What would you advise them? I would advise, you know, getting the tactile feel, getting the audible feedback as well when you're you're having a compression of a staple line. I think the leaks is the more worrisome part, right? And so if you're putting that stapler on and you can see the serosa cracking, that's probably a little bit too tight in that sense. And a, you need a high, higher, higher staple height. I think having that um, tissue feedback that takes time to develop, but um, listening to that pulse fire as well and taking your time and being patient is, is very important. There's some thought also you can give, um, one thing we haven't mentioned also is glucagon. Some patients or some surgeons out there are giving glucagon as well before to relax everything from the staple yeah. and the stomach doesn't have any, doesn't really care so much, but it actually thins it out as well. So there is also a thought of that. Um, that's, that'll be very interesting. I haven't started doing that, but I'll be curious to see. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have, we have five minutes before uh, Brian's uh, talk and I have some questions. Uh, questions just arrive the here. So first question is Torogula. Uh, ask it all of you to talk about your. We are going back a little bit. Uh, your preferable oversawing technique. Also, uh, he he did an experimental study with pigs. Staperless robotic sleeve gastrectomy safety and feasibility. So he is also saying that he uses robotic vessel sealer only without staplers to effectively resect the stomach and over sewing. So to answer uh, Tom's uh, questions, each of you, would you please uh, talk about your preferable over sewing technique? All of us or just a speaker? No, all of you. So I don't suture anymore. I haven't, I stopped suture since 2018. Not, Not a single suture, right? So that's done. Two is for you to resect your, st- your, your stomach with vessel sealer and suture by hand, I think there are a couple of things. One, I think you will be able to change the, um, the anatomy to a certain degree. So you're gonna, I think you're gonna have a high chance to create a spiral stomach, right? Or a tortured stomach, that's number one. Number two, you're adding so much time to the operation that I truly don't see that making sense at all. That's just my point two cents. 
Per what you think. Dr. I agree. Um, yeah, your technical error and the variability there, the staplers allow that to have that consistency. Um, and so I, the, the complications from the sleeves, right, besides the bleeding for the leaks is that spiraling, those issues post-op, all those revisions, as well as narrowing that insurance, right? And so we want to minimize that as much as possible. Dr. Hussein, please. Yeah, I concur. I think where I might see some utility is maybe in resource limited areas where a stapler may not be available, that it would be useful to have that skill set. But um, I don't know that I would hand sew a full staple line or full uh, division of this gastric uh, resection. I currently don't over sew. Uh, when I do, I tend to over sew the entire length of it, but I do. Um, I think I'm an expensive surgeon, I, I do use one of the staple line material reinforcements predominantly. So um, again, if I do do it, I tend to use a barb suture. I oversew from the fundus all the way down to the level of the incisura, but I don't always oversew the staple line that's at the level of the incisura for fear of over tightening that. So, Dr. Shabir, please. So um, I don't oversaw my staple line uh, under normal circumstances. If I do have to control hemorrhage, uh, I would put a Lambert suture, and that's how I would. I have uh, yet to recall a case that I've sutured the entire staple line. Um, to the question of uh, robotic vessel sealer and then <clears throat> oversaw to sewing the entire cut. Uh, line. Uh, I, I feel that the advantage of stapling is that when we look at it from inside, two mucosal surfaces oppose each other. You are actually left with no raw area for healing except for on the external serosal surface where fibrosis needs to occur, which means uh, long-term bleeding ulcer formation is much lesser with staple use. Uh, no matter how fine you suture, eventually with energy devices, there will be mucosal necrosis and that necrosis will heal uh, with inflammation and ulcer formation and always run the risk of bleeding in the near or the long term future. So my personal take would be, yes, it is probably cost effective, uh, but uh, it might run people into some trouble along the way. So I would caution myself in that way. Thank you. Brian, please. Yeah, I stopped oversawing as well. Um, when I did, I used the barb, like a, you know, generally a barb, 2-0 barb suture. Uh, and I would, same concept, I would stop somewhere near the angularis. And I, and I still actually do a couple of points of fixation to the gastric mesentery um, at the at the angularis as well. Um, I'm not sure if that's doing anything anymore, but I, I currently use a suction bougie and I don't think helixing and twisting is a problem, but back in the day when I used um, a non-suction bougie, I felt that there were times where I could get a little helixing if I wasn't careful. Um, Interestingly, I got called in for an emergency case a couple of weeks ago, and the patient had line on his plastica. Um, there was no mass, uh, but extremely thick stomach. And, and we're a small hospital. We don't have thoracic, we don't have surgical oncology. And I decided to just transect and do a subtotal gastrectomy and a gastrojejunostomy, kind of not burn a bridge for surgical oncology. And this tissue, the, the stomach was so thick, I had to cut through with scissors, I couldn't staple. And I was like, there's no way this is gonna hold, like it's impossible. You know, this is definitely gonna leak at some point, but it, amazingly it all held together, it was, it was fascinating. But so I, I, I do, you know, it, it is probably possible to over sew, but to Dr. Ma's point, you know, you get that consistency with a staple line that is tough to argue with, so. Thank you, Brian. Choose, choose <laughs> Andrea, would you please introduce our uh, last speaker? It's a pleasure and honor to present uh, Dr. Brian Benetti. He's a director of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeon Chairman of Surgery at Northern Duchess Hospital in Rhinebeck, New York. He's the founder of the Robotic Bariatric Surgery Program and is a robotic surgeon proctor. He's a certified robotic surgeon of excellence in SRS. He'll be talking about strategies to secure optimal hemostasis in robotic surgery. 
Thank you. Pull this up here. All right. So I figured the first two speakers would, would get into all the technical stuff. So I tried to keep it more technique based and little strategies I use that hopefully may be helpful to someone out there. Um, I generally am a, I'm a vessel seal user, not synchro seal. I like to, to be able to not burn the tissue if I want to cut. Um, so that's my, my uh, instrument of choice in the robot. I also use the CG. Um, full disclosure, I, I do get paid by Ethicon for speaking and consulting, but I do not get paid by the CG. Um, and what I do is I actually push the, the, the bougie all the way in. I do this for actually my bypasses and my sleeve. Uh, but I push it all the way in, um, essentially putting the fundus on detention. And to Dr. Tashera's point, you know, I, I feel like we're probably missing potentially some bleeds on the uh, greater curve and the short gastric. So what this does, it allows me to get my, um, I'm just going to pause here for a sec. I use a, my um, small grasping retractor for the liver. So I take my small grass retractor and I put it put it underneath the bougie, and then it kind of gives me all of those vessels perpendicularly, and so I feel like I get a better seal on all of those vessels because a lot of the times I can see them and I can kind of come right across them, and so again I just get my my um, small grasping retractor under there and kind of march along the greater curve, um, but I think it 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 kind of saves some time and it also um, gets me those vessels kind of very clearly. Um, in terms of staple height, I, I won't kind of, I won't beat this to death. I, I've gone to mainly blues um, and then usually a white or two. Um, if you compare the different stapler's, I used to be Covidian, I used all purples. Um, and once I saw this kind of this chart, I noticed, oh, well, blue is basically the same as purple. Why am I using gold or green? Um, is what, what I used to do when I switched over to Echelon. Um, I tend not to staple with the shore form. Um, I have uh, PAs that will fire at the bedside, so I've kind of trained them to fire at the bedside. I don't like the, the pausing and, and the, the time it takes to do the shore form. Uh, but if you look at the shore form and basically subtract out the gold, um, the shore form is basically the same as the Echelon Flex in terms of state place. I do use reinforcement. Um, I tend to use the SLR from Ethicon. I used to use the um, Gore Seam Guard. Um, the more talks I give and the more people I meet across the country, it's fascinating. There, there's a lot of people who don't use any reinforcement anymore. And you know, you read some of the literature and, and it seems to, to suggest that we don't need to use it. I like the handle of the reinforcement. Um, and also gives me a little peace of mind. But again, it's all anecdotal stuff. Um, you know, but you know, essentially, and you guys all um have seen a reinforced staple line, but I, I do like the ability to manipulate the the staple line uh post post stapling. Uh gives me a little extra handle to kind of work with or suture with. Um and I do this for my sleeves and my bypasses. I, over time, I've, I've gotten to the point where I am um, making my bypasses look more sleeve-like. This is actually sleeve, but I'll, there will be a little shot of a bypass as well. Um, but I do like the the feel of the reinforced stable line. So same concept. I'll make that sleeve-like pouch for the bypass. So at the end of the procedure, um, I will generally um, do a little touch up. So I use a fen by mostly. You can also use the vessel seal if you want. But with the um, staple lines, especially the reinforced staple lines, it's easy to kind of touch those uh, little spots. Anywhere I see a little bit of redness, I'll tend to burn it. Um, and I'll kind of just move through and find any little spots. Here's the JJ. The JJ, I use all whites. Um, and I don't do any reinforcement, so you have to be a little bit more careful when you're burning with the fen by. But I feel like it's a a nice technique to kind of stop any of that staple line bleed intraoperatively. 
And then what I've got into, which some of the other speakers have talked about, um, I, I've started using phenylephrine. Um, so as that staple line is started to complete, I'll have the anesthesiologist start to kind of judiciously use phenylephrine to get the, the blood pressure up to, you know, the 150-ish range. And here's one where <laughs> you may want to think twice sometimes, but this thing just exploded. You know, it was like totally dry. And then it just went off um, after the phenyl the phenylephrine went in. But I do think, you know, there's this push now to discharge patients the same day. I think that's probably going to be the next wave, at least in the U.S., in terms of the insurance companies getting us to discharge these patients. And then there are private practice surgeons who have surgery centers who it, who it benefits as well. I do think it helps to find all this stuff intraoperatively, but you can see it just kind of like crazy going off in here. But I, I you know, gladly she didn't bleed postoperatively. All this bleeding was done in the OR. Um, and it was all stopped in the OR. But essentially the whole staple line was bleeding. And this one was all blues. So you can see the whole thing. So. And that's the worst when you when you leave the operating room and everything is like bone dry. And you have to come back for a bleed or the patient bleeds and you have to transfuse them. Very frustrating. But again, I'll use that that fen by and just kind of march along the, the staple line. And that reinforcement gives me a little handle to kind of work with. We've gotten a little bit more into the hemostatics. Um, generally, if I'm going to put a patient back on full dose anticoagulation, post op day one. Um, if a patient's on antiplatelet therapies, if a patient's very anemic, um, I'll, I'll tend to use uh, topical hemostatics. I still do all of the little touch up, stop the bleed, and then I spray the hemostatics on. Again, I, I think at the end of the day, um, it, it gives you peace of mind. I don't know if it's necessarily stopping a bleed. Uh, there was one uh, paper that showed a thousand consecutive sleeve gastrectomies where they used um, a fibrin glue and they, they had a 0.3% uh, bleed rate, which I thought was interesting. Um, there was two bigger studies, one that was prospectively randomized, which basically said, all the stuff you do is worthless, don't do anything, just stable. And then the other one was a meta-analysis, which said, the only thing you shouldn't do is nothing. So again, there's a lot of uh, information out there. There's a lot of these, these studies, but you know, I think at the end of the day, um, it's probably common sense, patient specific and surgeon specific, um, but I don't think there's any one right way to do it. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So by your presentation, can I assume that uh, robotic surgery is a lonely place to go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, you have to you have to be comfortable with your PEs if you're gonna um, if you're gonna allow them to staple for sure. Um, but you know, I, I still do laparoscopic. Uh, you know, when when I don't have a robotic room, or sometimes I'll get two operating rooms, which is nice. But but um, you know, I do. I, I personally think the robot is more for our pleasure than it is for the the outcome of the patient. You know, I, I really enjoy the immersion in the robot. Um, and, and the tissue planes and seeing them and things like that. So I think the, the robot is more for my, my benefit than anyone else's. So Luciana, so yeah, coming from me, right? You know, I love my robot, right? So uh, I don't think it matters if you use a robotic stapler, a handheld stapler, a Titan stapler, whatever stapler you want to use, right? As we saw, I think on, the, on this discussion with our three amazing talks, basically to me is take your time, you know, got to ride the load. Patient, there's a lot of patient variability that has to be part of it. So uh, in my mind, that's what the big things are, right? The, the, the big changes in, 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 in bleeding. I mean, I don't know. What, what do you think, Brian? Do you, do you think using a one step versus R makes a big difference since you do both now? No, I think to Dr. Ma's point, it's, it's, it's probably on us, right? Like we're, we're the ones who... You know, these, these staplers are pretty um, well designed and, and pretty standardized, right? So I think it's what we're doing that's probably the cause of the problem. Um, I just wish I could know exactly 
what what that difference was to have a post op lead versus the what the problem is yeah, exactly exactly I just don't know the problem I haven't figured out the problem yet with me so I just need another uh, problem one day one day Dr. Shabir. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, lovely talk. Uh, Brian, I saw during your video presentations, you were using the vessel sealer to kind of seal on the staple line. Um, do you feel that can cause any tissue issues and leak rates uh, differently? Um, because you went from serosal muscle all the way into mucosal surface, or is there something that I couldn't pick up on the video? Um, I'm trying to like, it's a little bit more difficult to do with the vessel sealer, I would say, than the Fenby. The Fenby, you can be a little bit more targeted. The vessel seal, you have to leave the tips open a little bit more to arc onto the, um, onto the staple line. Um, but I, ha I have not yet seen any uh, ischemic issues or, or leaks because of the, the robotic. Um, okay. Actually, the only, I've had, you know, I've had two leaks that I can remember that were like primary sleeves and both were done laparoscopically. Thank you. So Andre, can you please, uh, you you are now 100% into robotics. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. No basis. <laughs> No, no, but, but, but so, so again, right? It's not about convincing, not convincing, right? So I'm 100% robotic. I have not, the only white load I use is in the bow. I still use one green and, and, one, and everything else blue on my pouch and, and you know, on my sleeves. Let's talk about sleeves, right? And when people talk about these bleedings, I, I don't see that, right? I, I don't see people say, oh my God, I have so much bleeding that I have to downsize to a white, right? I just, I don't see it, right? Um, you know, and I agree with you. I, I'll check it. You know, before I go, I take the tube out, the VCG, take that out. I test. I put like um, methylene blue with 100 cc of saline through the tube, right? Am I looking for a leak? No, I'm looking to put pressure on that staple line to make it bleed. If it bleeds, then I'll, I'll colorize and stop it, right? So, I mean, to me, uh, it, it's not about. I mean, I'm not going. I'm not going to make the technology work for me, right? I mean, I I don't have to conform to the technology, right? If I'm doing, I've done two thousand sleeves robotically, and, and and I had almost no bleeding. Why do I need to change to a white load? And now I'm starting having an issue of maybe have a scheme and so forth. You still can have a bleed with a white load. So to me. You have to do what makes you sleep better at night. If it makes you sleep better at night, spraying, glue, whatever you do, it just do it at the same time every time. The problem is when you change one case, I do this way, then another case, I do that way. That's when you get in trouble, right? To me, has worked. No questions about it. I agree with the sleep part. I like to sleep. <laughs> Dr. Shabir, are you uh, into robotics? Uh, well, we were into robotics. We did some robotic work, but it is expensive in our part. Um, not only the fact that uh, we need to pay for consumables, but the there's also capital investment, which we need to also pay for, uh, which is quite difficult. So that's why we have come out of robotics back into laparoscopic. Uh, we wait for price to be competent and then move back into robotics. Yeah. And no, this is happening in Singapore, <laughs> in Singapore. So, Piero, are you into robotics? Not at all. So I'm one of the old people, I guess, that I have yet to do robotics. And they are knocking at the door. They're probably outside right now trying to get in the robotics rep. But um, not yet. We, that, that is something maybe in the future. But uh, right now, 100% laparoscopic or, I guess, some open in those disaster cases, but yes, laparoscopic mostly. Dr. Hassan? Yes, I do do robotics, probably now about 75% robotic and still 25% laparoscopic. So look, different, different things in the same country. So in California, no robotics, 
And Brian, your percentage of laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery in bariatrics. Please tell me. Um, yeah. I'd say it's probably 60, 70 robotic, 67% robotic. We only, we only have run one robot in our hospital. I'm in a small, like a uh, 80 bed hospital. So we only have about, we have one robot and then the rest of the rooms are laparoscopic. So, so primary and revisional? Uh, primary and revisional. Okay. So guys, do you want to uh, talk anything? We have three minutes. Andrea? I have a quick question for uh, know, Pearl. When you do, when you use the white load, do you use reinforcement? No. Do you use reinforcement on any loads? Maybe my blue, but then I'm like, if it bleeds, because you still see that bleeding on the first staple fire on the answer on the blue, I'm like, dang, I should have just downsized to white. But then I'm like, still a little bit chicken on the white on the first fire sometimes. I know some people will do whites all the way up. And it's just sometimes that just doesn't, it's like the sorosol, it's like, oh, I'm kind of stressing out the stapler a little bit too much. But um, I used right. to over sew routinely as using fellows. We use as a teaching technique for sewing for prenatal for laparoscopic. And so the staple line sewing it down all the way was a great way to teach. Um, but it does add time to the, the case. And so. Pearl, let me ask you this. Because you, you said there is a difference when your bleeding rate. Um, was that statistically different or just nominal? Nominal. Because our bleed mm. rates are so low already. It's, it's yes, exactly normal. right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Pearl, can I ask a question? Uh, Pearl, do you recommend or do you yourself religiously follow compression times that are prescribed by various vendors? Uh, do you think that that could potentially play a role, the impatience of a surgeon trying to finish a sleeve in 20 minutes and then going check, 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 check. Okay, next, check, 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 next, rather than waiting for that good 20 seconds to allow tissues to settle in into the stapler jobs. Any thoughts? Do I have a timer that counts down or a nurse that tells me, oh, it's okay to fire? I know some people that do that. Um, yeah. No, I don't count. I, I just, yeah, I, I, and then I do, sometimes I do the pulse fire because I forgot to count sometimes. And I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, I should probably wait. And then it feels like it's 20 seconds or so. But why do you have to, why do you have to do all this stuff, right? The stapler should be perfect. And, and that's what hopefully one day we can get to. And then that's what the hopefully. Medtronic folks are saying, right? You don't have to wait. And you should, you should use our stapler or you should use our stapler. And so. I don't know if any of you guys have met the, um, it was, I think it's Dr. Thompson. He, he's the one who does the Titan stapler, that, that one fire stapler. He's like a very big proponent because he originally had that clamp where you fired along the clamp. I trialed that. So he's a very big proponent of um, like the pulse fire, like wait every set, you know, one second, fire a little bit, one second, fire a little bit. But he says that the, the Titan stapler changes heights like every centimeter or two, basically from the fundus all the way to the antrum, which I thought was interesting. But um, I, I personally don't. I personally don't pulse fire uh, at all. I don't know if anyone does. It also depends on the edema of the tissue too, right? You see that tissue, and then yeah. you may want to pulse fire in some of those. Yeah. Okay. No. I'm, I'm glad you showed video. Of the uh, of the cauterization of the staple line, and it was very precise and very cautious. There are some papers that talk about is it safe to do because we're always taught don't do that because it can weaken the staple line. But the videos that you showed are very very precise um, cauterization, which is good, not just a big bipolar grab. Um, so I, I like that part of your video very much. Thanks. So guys, I want to deeply thank all of you. Uh, you are sharing your time and your knowledge and we are reaching unbelievable places with that. So thank you very much. Hope to see you next week in Rio for SRS. And I'm um, getting back to Ariel. Is our Hollywood guy there? Ariel?
Yes. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors that our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. And don't forget to mark your calendars as the 4th IBC University of Oxford World Congress is taking place September 18th through the 20th of 2023 at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. The Congress has been awarded 18 CPD points from the Royal College of Surgeons of England and 2025 20, AMA PRA credits by Cinnamon. For more information, go to ibcclub.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. Oh,